All right, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to the online students as well. Uh, we will begin today with Exodus. Yesterday, we were talking about Genesis. And um, hopefully, you learned a few new things. And today, we will be moving into the book of Exodus. And uh, we'll just look at, uh, you know, get a brief overview of this particular book. Uh, now, um, yesterday, there were no questions in the online Google Classroom stream. So uh, maybe there were no doubts from the book of Genesis, or at least no simple doubts that can be clarified easily. Uh, so um, and um, today, too, you know, if you have anything, online students, if you have any doubts, any questions, uh, feel free to post uh, them on the stream page of the Google Classroom. All right. Um, so Exodus. Exodus covers quite a large period of time. Uh, we see the account beginning sometime uh, before Moses' arrival. That is, uh, you know, for about 400 years after the death of Joseph, you had the Israelites living over there in the land and uh, uh, of Egypt. And so now those 400 years are almost done. And uh, that is when this book of Exodus begins. So it covers the time span from the time of uh, Joseph's death right up to the setting up of the tabernacle in the wilderness. That entire time period is covered in our uh, book of Exodus. And uh, as we all know, the main focus of Exodus is on uh, how God delivers the Israelites from Egypt. And also it talks about how this Israelite uh, people become a nation. Up to that time, they were just known as a people group of slaves. But now, once they come out uh, of Egypt, they become uh, a nation of their own. And of course, in the uh, coming books, we would see how they you know, establish themselves in their own land and all of those uh, further details. Uh, so what happened to them in uh, Egypt was not something unanticipated, something you know shocking because the Lord already knew that they would go through this phase of slavery. We see that very clearly mentioned in Genesis itself. Uh, in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 to 21, the Lord tells um, Abraham beforehand itself that the Israelites will be enslaved for about 400 years in the land of Egypt. So this is something that the Lord already was aware of and informed Abraham about. And then there's something important that the Lord says to Abraham. He says that after they are delivered, after they come out of Egypt and they enter into the promised land, he says that in that place, God would use the Israelites as his instrument of judgment. And we see that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. So um, maybe we can have one person read out here in the classroom. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. Uh, and um, those of us who are online, if we could please you know, follow this in our Bibles. It talks about the how the, the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its peak, but when the time comes, then Israelites will be used as God's instrument to judge the Amorites. So over here, the term Amorites is being used as a, as a commonplace general term to refer to all the uh, Canaanite nations which are there in the land of um, Canaan. Uh, because the Amorites were a larger people group, and so, so in certain places we see that rather than you know referring to them as Canaanites, the term Amorites is used. So it, it's not specifically talking about just the Amorite people because God's judgment does come upon the other uh, people groups living over there as well. So over here in this particular verse, Genesis 15, 16, uh, the term Amorite is being used as a common term to refer to all of the uh, people who are living in the land of Canaan upon whom the judgment would be coming. And uh, if I remember rightly, uh, it's, I think, seven 
we would actually deal with this in the book of Joshua. Uh, but I think it's specifically seven people groups that God wants to bring judgment upon. And so he specifically tells the Israelites to target those particular people groups and bring God's judgment upon them, you know, through war and through invasion and, and conquest of that land. Um, and so uh, coming to the writing styles which have been used in the book of Exodus, now we are more familiar with this uh, term genre which we looked at last class. So there are two genres mentioned here in our book of Exodus. We, of course, have narrative history. This is a historical record being written in prose form. But we also have uh, a legal lists of laws, many laws writ written down in, in, a, in a legal writing style, you know, which was used uh, in, in the ancient Near East in those times. So that particular writing style is used to, um, to write out the many instructions and laws which the Lord began to give to Moses. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to stand close to the mic, so I hope that now I'm more clear to the online students um, because you know one of you had said that the volume is not too clear. So I hope I'm more audible now. Yeah. All right. Um, now again, based on the chronology uh, which is there in First Kings chapter six, you know, which we talked about yesterday, based on the chronology uh, given over there, they assess, they you know, they calculate backward and they assess that most probably Moses wrote uh, Exodus between 1450 and 1410 BC, and in fact, in the book of Exodus, we have at least three or four mentions. Where it actually, where the Lord says to Moses, write down what I am saying. So we have evidence that Moses was actually writing down and recording all the things that were taking place. Um, maybe we could just look at one example of that. Um, Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. If we could have one person read out that, please. Exodus 17, verse 14. So there are many occasions where the Lord tells him, write down these things, because these things should be recorded and preserved for future generations as well. So this is uh, kind of evidence. It's kind of proof that Moses was the author of Exodus. So um, you know those who say that Moses did not write, uh, they would have to deal with these verses, where it clearly says that Moses were, was putting down a written record and these he would have later uh, edited and re-edited and you know uh, composed into a final format. Uh, so we can be quite sure that Moses was involved in the writing of the book of Exodus. Um, what else? Some of the key personalities that we find in this book, uh, we have, of course, Moses himself because he's the leader who leads the people. We also have Miriam, uh, who's given emphasis. Uh, because you know she she figures in the beginning of the book where she is you know assisting her baby brother. Then later on also she um, acts as a prophetess and sings out songs to the Lord. So we have Miriam uh, playing an active role. Of course we have Pharaoh and Pharaoh's daughter who play an important part uh, in the you know events which take place. Uh, we also have Aaron, and uh, of course Joshua is also mentioned. We have Joshua being introduced in the book of Exodus. Now, coming to the structure of Exodus, um, we could say that the first seven chapters form section one, uh, because in the first seven chapters, we get an idea of what the Israelites were going through in Egypt. We, we see that they have been enslaved, and the Pharaoh is very much against them, and uh, life is very, very difficult for them. And we also get an introduction uh, to Moses in the first seven chapters. We can say that se uh, chapters 7 to 13 form the second section, the second important section, uh, because in chapters 7 to 13 is where we see the Lord releasing all those 10 plagues upon the Egyptians. Uh, we also see uh, you know, the 
final judgment of death on the firstborn, which comes upon uh, all the people who refuse to yield to Yahweh. And we also see an account of the Passover, where because the uh, Israelites and some of the other people choose to obey uh, Yahweh and you know um, cover their front door with the blood of the uh, sacrifice, they are spared and God passes over them and does not judge them. So we see all of those things in the second section, chapters 7 to 13. Coming to the third section, we, we could probably say that that would be chapters uh, 14 to 18. So chapters 14 to 18 is uh, where it actually talks about how they make their exodus. The term exodus literally means going out, exiting. So they exit Egypt, they leave Egypt, and they set out. So uh, that would be recorded in uh, chapters 14 to 18. And we also see how uh, God brings judgment upon the army which tries to pursue them. And they are all killed uh, over there at the Red Sea. So we see an account of that. The next section, main section, uh, would be uh, chapters 19 to 24, where you have uh, the laws and instructions which are being given by God. All those would be found in. Uh, chapters 19 to 24 and finally we come to chapters 25 to 40 uh, the last section where you have specific instructions being given regarding the priests regarding how they should worship uh, regarding the construction of the tabernacle all of those things are found in the last section chapters 25 to 40 now um, <coughs> in your uh, textbook we have a comparison being made uh, you know exodus being compared with the other books of the bible and um, the comparison made with the book of leviticus is interesting uh, because it talks about how in exodus we are introduced to the passover lamb you know, where, where uh, the people are told that they must sacrifice the lamb and apply its blood on the uh, on, on their front door uh, so exodus introduces us to the Passover lamb, but the details about the sacrifices and all of that, uh, that comes in the next, uh, we, we find that in the next book, which is Leviticus. And um, so in Exodus, we see God taking the initiative to reach out to the people, uh, to help them and to deliver them. But in Leviticus, the people are being urged to make uh, take the initiative and reach out to God. So in Exodus, it's God reaching out to the Israelites. And in Leviticus, it's the people who are being encouraged to reach back to God, reach out to him and respond to him, uh, you know, by following all that the Lord is teaching them. So in the book of Exodus, we have God coming to them as their savior because he wants to deliver them, redeem them. But in, in Leviticus, he is more their sanctifier. He wants them to change their lifestyle, start following the laws which have been laid down and uh, reach out to God and establish a relationship with him. So this is the kind of comparison that we see between Exodus and uh, Leviticus. So having done with those preliminaries, let's come to the, some of the key concepts, some of the key events, you know, uh, things that maybe we can focus on in this book of Exodus. And uh, yeah, my hand wavers. You know, do not hesitate when it, when we when we hit 11, 50, no, 1140, right? 1140, you know, don't hesitate. Just wave your hand till you get my attention because I think uh, people have a right to ask their questions. Okay, so um, um, coming to the first um, thing that we can focus on, why was Pharaoh was so concerned about the Israelites increasing in number? Uh, why did that, why did he feel so threatened by that? And uh, the main reason for that would be, in those days, the larger the number of people, the larger would be the army. Because, I mean, now we just use uh, weapons. Uh, you know, we can even use remote, long-distance weapons. But in those days, it's literally hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so the larger your army is, the more people you have fighting on your side, so the greater chances of you winning in a battle. And so for them, a large population was so important. And here you have outsiders living in the land of Egypt. And not only are they just living over there, they are flourishing. 
their numbers are increasing exploding so imagine if one day all the israelites think to themselves hey why don't we form an army and take over this land this is a nice place instead of having an egyptian pharaoh sitting over there on the throne we can have one of our own guys sitting there on the throne so that was a threat it was a serious threat which the pharaoh would have thought about uh, so uh, which is why it says you know in the beginning of exodus a uh, pharaoh who did not know the israelites because earlier there was an understanding between the previous pharaoh and the people the people were grateful to the pharaoh for having taken them into his land and all of that so there was there were amicable relationships but now a new pharaoh has come to the throne he does not really know any of the israelites personally and he starts seeing them as a danger because their numbers are increasing so rapidly they could do something if they wish to also the fact that um they have settled down in the land of goshen which was in fact a very fertile very prosperous region which means the israelites would have been financially in a very sound state they would have had lots of flocks they would have had a lot of cro crops so financially they would have been in a really good place so if they really want to mobilize and turn themselves into an army and fight against the egyptians they could have done that and so out of fear for these things um pharaoh decides that he's going to take away all of their rights all of their properties and he's going to reduce them into a bunch of slaves who, who would have absolutely no uh, rights of any kind they would have no property nothing they would be completely dependent upon the pharaoh so he deliberately reduces them to that state to kind of keep them under control and when even that doesn't work he starts panicking because you see in spite of making them into slaves they are still flourishing they are still increasing in numbers and so then he uh, you know you know issues an order saying that the babies should be killed in the hope that at least then maybe the population would reduce so for him uh, you know if you were to place yourself in in his shoes he did consider the israelites as a serious danger to his throne and in fact to his kingdom um coming to another aspect that maybe we should uh, dwell upon he says specifically when he gives his order that the baby should be thrown into the nile now there are a i mean it's a very terrible thing to even think about but you know if you want to kill a child there are a hundred different ways in which in which a child can be killed why specifically is he saying that they should be thrown into the river nile and uh, that has a religious significance because for them for the egyptians the nile was a holy river something which is easy for us indians to understand because you know um, in india too we have rivers which are regarded by certain religions as being holy so uh, for instance uh, the river ganga is considered holy because they believe it is the personification of that particular idol you know by the name of ganga so they believe that that um, uh, that this river is a personification of um, or rather the, yeah the river is a personification of that uh, particular god so in that sense this nile was significant to these people because they believed that um that the god of the nile was apis which was actually a bull and uh, another goddess named isis so these were considered to be the gods of the nile and the waters which are flowing over there in the nile that's actually supposed to be the blood of one of the other gods named osiris so for them on at various levels this particular uh, river had a lot of religious significance so if these babies of of these foreign babies which belong to a different people if they are uh, sacrificed to the river you know uh, it would be like a um, like a offering which the pharaoh is giving to his gods so he specifies that the babies which are being born should be uh, thrown into the nile uh, as a kind of offering to their to their egyptian gods so there is religious significance in that also uh, you know we we have that instance mentioned where you have the pharaoh's daughter going to the river uh, to take a bath why i mean does she have no bathroom in her own palace you know she's after all the princess she would have her own private pool 
you know she doesn't exactly need to use anybody else's bathroom in fact she has she like she'll have her own special preheated pool so why would she go there to the river you know to to dunk herself in the water over there again religious significance so and this is again something easy for us indians to understand because people go all the way to the ganges not because there's any shortage of bathrooms in india but because they believe that to be a holy place and so if they go and you know uh, dunk themselves in the water there that would be part of their purification process so the nile was considered very very um, significant uh, by the egyptians due to its you know religious overtones now coming to the next aspect when god brings the plagues upon the egyptians he he is very he chooses his plagues in a very uh, strategic manner so it's not just that randomly god thinks okay fine i think uh, you know insects would be a good idea let me send some insects and i think i'll, I'll add some frogs as well no it's not that there's a, again a very strong spiritual significance behind each of the 10 plagues you know just for us to um, uh, you know look at a few examples uh, we have uh, you know the frogs which are sent as one of the plagues now the frog uh, god was very sacred to the egyptians um it was called something hekka yeah right hekka the okay not a god a goddess okay uh, hekka was a frog headed goddess so the frog was considered sacred and uh, it was a serious offense to kill frogs so the egyptians would never kill frogs but now when there's a plague of frogs you literally have pharaoh pleading with uh, moses saying please can you get rid of these frogs indirectly he's saying you know can you kindly get rid of hekka our you know our goddess so you see god is very deliberately trying to show pharaoh and the egyptians that hey i am the god of gods and the lord of lords and you you should be submitting to me he's giving them a chance he's giving them a demonstration and showing that if you follow me you would be under my protection and you know things can change for you so god is trying to give them clear evidence of who he is that he is the true and living god and uh, so that is the attack upon the frog goddess uh, coming to just one of the other um, you know plagues that is sent uh, we have the plague of boils now the priests who would perform you know the different rituals in the in the egyptian temples they needed to be very pure and clean especially their skin you would not they should not have any kind of skin diseases and most definitely not any boils and now when the people break out in boils you have even the priests all of them covered with boils which means now they cannot even enter into any of their temples and perform the rituals because they would be going inside in a very unclean condition so that again we see is a direct attack upon uh, the egyptian religions the belief system which they had at that time uh to take another example um egypt you know even in fact even today egypt as we know has a very low uh, ratio of rainfall um that's just because you know uh, the because of the region that uh, you know that it's situated in and um they say that there is less than 1 inch a year in cairo so uh, you know um they mainly depend on uh, this extensive irrigation projects which they have and of course you have the nile so uh, you know so uh, they mainly depend on that for their water supply so um isis was supposed to be was it isis or someone else can't remember their gods and goddesses um okay so yeah yeah it is isis she was supposed to be the god of the air and the rain and all of that and uh, so you know if they are placing their belief in this particular goddess and she supposed to be supplying them with rain uh with all her ability you know mythologically speaking with all her ability she's only able to provide one inch of rain in an entire year uh but now what does the lord do he says what is rain rain is nothing let me actually bring down hail and not just li tiny little uh, pellets of hail but you know literally large huge stones of hail which are big enough to inflict damage and uh, so again and again through the plagues 
God is trying to show them because never ever forget that he is a God of compassion. He likes to redeem. He likes to save. He likes to show people that, hey, if you can come to me, I can change things for you. So he is trying to show the Egyptians again and again that I am the true and living God and I am demonstrating We cannot hear you. We cannot hear anything. familiar with their own God. But Moses is asking here, if when I go to them and I say, your, your, the God of your forefathers has come to deliver you, and they ask, who is he? What is his name? What do I say? It shows the condition in which the Israelites were at this particular you know, point in time, where they did not even know who their God is. They had forgotten uh, or the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. That was their condition. And we have a reference to this in um, OK, so it is audible, is it? Uh, that's good. Then um, someone has asked, why, do you, why don't you repeat what was said? I was just talking about how uh, um, the Israelite people had forgotten their own God. You know, uh, if, when you look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 to 16, uh, Moses says to the Lord, Lord, when I go to the people and tell them that God wants to deliver you, and if they say to me, what is his name, what do I say? 
So it shows that the Israelites were no longer even aware of who their God was, who the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph is, uh, because they have, uh, you know, been indulging themselves in idolatry for so long that they have forgotten their own God. Um, and we see evidence of this in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Uh, if we could have maybe one person turn to Joshua 24, verse 14, and read out that particular verse, uh, because that shows what the Israelites were doing during their time in Egypt. 24, 14. Now then, they appeared to the Lord, serving in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. So it says here very clearly, jo Joshua is speaking to the people and he says, you know, the gods that your ancestors worshipped. So for the at least maybe maybe for maybe about a hundred years, you know, after Joseph's death, maybe the people continued being faithful to the Lord. But after that, they all gradually began to slip into idolatry. They began to worship the gods of the Egyptians. And so over here, Joshua is very specifically bringing up that point and he says, Throw away these gods that your ancestors have been worshipping in Egypt. It's time for you to return to the Lord. And that is why, you know, Moses asks this strange question. Because he knows, he knows that the people have, except for a few faithful ones, like Moses' parents, who have been holding on to the true God, the rest have gone so far away that they do not even know the name of the Lord. And uh, that, that is why Moses raises that question. And God says, uh, this is my name, you know, and the Lord says, I am who I am. And uh, it can also be translated as, uh, I will be who I will be, because oh, they, it, it does not really give us a tense. It's not necessarily past tense or present tense. It's all tenses. In the sense, he just is. He's not confined inside time. So he just is. He was, he is, he will be. He always just is. He's outside of time. And he says that. He says, tell them that this is who I am. And so there is a time aspect to this, to this phrase where God says, I am that I am. Um, so he is outside of time. He's unlimited in that sense. But he's also unlimited in all the other senses. Because you see, at least for the last 300 years, these Israelites have been worshipping uh, Osiris, who is supposed to give them crops. They have, uh, they have been worshipping, um, you know, Isis, who is supposed to take care of their dead after they die and go to wherever they are supposed to be going. Uh, this Isis is supposed to look after them over there. So they've been worshipping this Isis. And they have been um, uh, worshipping all these other gods. And all the other gods have their departments. You know, the, uh, the, the Osiris can give you crops, but he really can't do anything much for you once you die. You know, so for that you need someone else. And uh, you have uh, this particular god who gives you uh, victory in war. I uh, can't remember the name. Uh, I think now uh, Horus. Horus is the person who's supposed to give you victory. And Horus cannot make your crops grow. Horus can only you know, give you victory in war. These are all limited entities that the Egyptians have uh, created you know, and have um, you know, written down, written records about these um, entities whom they themselves have manufactured. But the, this one who says, I am that I am, he is everything. You can't say, OK, you are, I'm, uh, you know, you're limited to providing agricultural uh, fertility. And you can't say, oh, OK, this is the God you know, who uh, gives rain. No, he is everything. I mean, in fact, apart from him, nothing was ever made that was made. He is all. And he brought this world into creation. So there is great significance in this phrase, I am that I am. You can't define me. The Lord is saying, you can't define me. You can't say, I am this, 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 and I'm just that. I'm beyond that. I'm beyond anything that your human mind can even begin to imagine or think. Because, uh, you know, uh, as humans, there are things that we understand. There are things that we know exist. But there are things beyond our understanding which we do not even know anything about and he is lord over all of that as well so he says i am that i am no limitations of any kind uh, beyond all understanding beyond all comprehension so that phrase i am that i am 
encompasses all that he is and he is infinitely beyond our understanding okay so we see the beauty of uh, of god presenting himself revealing himself to these slaves in that manner because they were living in such tight restricted um, you know um, um, imprisoned situations and circumstances and here is someone who is unlimited coming to them and offering himself to them and saying i will be your redeemer and you will have no limitations because he is limitless so this is actually a great uh, offer that god is making to them over here um okay uh, what else can we look at oh yeah this one question which is generally raised um they say god hardened pharaoh's heart what a terrible thing to do i mean poor pharaoh there he was all innocent sitting on his throne and god hardened his heart you know and they kind of make it sound as though um god deliberately chose to turn someone into evil but they um don't you know dwell on the fact that long before god said anything the man had already made plans to take people who are living peacefully in the land of goshen minding their own business he takes away their land he takes away their crops you see they had legal right to that land it was given to them by a previous pharaoh there were legal papers to back up the property that they had and this man takes away everything that they have this pharaoh takes away everything that they have and starts plotting on how he can harm them and destroy them and at that point of time no one was hardening his heart his heart was his own to do with as he wishes there are steps which pharaoh takes all by himself without any compulsion or outside pressure from anyone and then we come to exodus chapter 7 verses 13 to 14 okay and uh, it would be good if we could read these two verses exodus chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 uh, you know if we can have someone uh, quickly read that over here please and hoping that all of you can hear online i'm trying to talk extra loudly so um, exodus 7 13 to 14 yes yes the father was hard he gave hard and he would not listen to them just as the lord had said then the lord said to moses pharaoh's heart was unbelieving he refuses to let the people go Okay, so Aaron performs a sign. He takes the staff, the wooden staff, and turns it into a snake. And uh, we know the rest of the story because we know we're running out of time. Uh, but the point is, uh, God demonstrates that He is more powerful than all the magic which they can come up with. And after seeing that with his own eyes, you know all that is done right in front of the Pharaoh. After seeing that. Pharaoh chooses to harden his heart. At this point of time, nobody is hardening his heart. He's, he's taking a decision on his own. He chooses to think, okay, even though I'm seeing that this God is more powerful, no, 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 I don't want to give in. I do not want to submit. And we continue seeing in uh, Exodus seven twenty two, eight fifteen, eight nineteen, eight thirty two, nine seven. Even as all the five plagues are going on, it is. Pharaoh, who chooses to harden his own heart, no one is forcing him to harden his heart in all of these Bible verses. And then, finally, in Exodus nine twelve, God does what God told you know He would do because God knew about this, and so God had told Moses already. This is what is going to happen. Even though again and again you're going to go to Pharaoh, he will refuse to believe. He will choose to harden his heart. and god says i will harden this heart okay so the first step is taken by pharaoh himself he makes a conscious choice even though five plagues demonstrate the power of god they demonstrate that god is superior to all other beings pharaoh still chooses to harden his heart and then the lord steps in and god says if this man chooses to continue hardening his heart then i will help him i will assist him to destroy himself and so it is only in exodus chapter 9 verse 12 that god steps in and begins to harden his heart and so we see in 9 12 10 1 um, and then in chapter 11 and chapter 14 that god hardens his heart uh, so it is the same even for people i mean uh, the rest of us you know 
uh, it's a kind of word of caution. Again and again, we who are in the New Testament times, the Holy Spirit will again and again convict us, convict us, convict us. But if we choose to continue hardening our hearts, then the Lord at some point would say, all right, if you want to suffer and learn, you know, learn your lessons from that, you know, he would say, fine, go ahead. And so he would allow us to continue hardening our hearts. And then, you know, we would fall, we would hurt ourselves, there would be serious consequences and all of that. So um, the Lord never starts out hardening anyone's heart. The choice is given to the person to decide what, what they would like to do, what choices they would like to make. And it's only when they continue to walk in those ways that God says, uh, yeah, God says that, you know, he would need to step in and take action. Um, all right. So uh, we are almost out of time. And anyone who has questions. There are no questions. We still have another six minutes to go. Uh, if anyone has any questions, shall we then move on into the next point? All right. Um, why was the final judgment, the God's final judgment upon Egypt was uh, the you know killing of the firstborn? Why? Why were the firstborn uh, sons killed? That is because the Egyptians, uh, in their uh, religious tradition, the firstborn of each household, uh, the male, the boy, the first male uh, uh, born into that home, he would be dedicated to their Egyptian gods. So he would be he's supposed to serve the uh, the, the Egyptian gods. And uh, so after seeing nine plagues and after seeing the power of Yahweh during those nine plagues. Those who still refuse to place the blood on their doorpost, they would have, in their indirectly say, we choose to continue dedicating our children to our gods. They are not willing to submit and yield to Yahweh. And so the judgment that comes upon them, um, okay, doesn't really help much. But yeah, we still have five minutes to go. Okay, so. God's judgment comes upon the firstborn because the firstborn of each family was dedicated to the Egyptian gods and those uh, refused to change their loyalties and switch to Yahweh. All of them who refused to place the blood on their front door, uh, they are the ones who's, uh, you know, who come under the judgment of God's, the judgment of death which comes upon the First one. All right, maybe, um, yeah, any questions at all? Because I have the ability to go on and on forever. So, no questions. All right, just one last. I just want to cram in how much more information I can so that maybe we will to you somewhere down the line. Uh, one question which they asked is you know, a bunch of slaves came out of Egypt. And uh, you know, they go through the wilderness and then they finally arrive at the promised land. Where on earth did they pick up weapons from? How did they become into an army? Um, so, you know, they, there are people who just like to criticize and comment on the things given in the Bible. But uh, there are easy answers to these things because we see, you know, even before the Israelites leave the land of Egypt, uh, God tells them, ask from your neighbors, ask for gold, ask for uh, you know um, wealth, and also you know it says over here in Exodus 12 verse 35 to 36, it says um, the Lord who made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So uh, we do not know what and all they asked for, but they might have asked even for weapons. It says they plundered the Egyptians. So they literally um, wiped out anything of value. So weapons were something very, very valuable. So I'm pretty sure that any um, you know, careful, strategic thinking Israelites would have asked even for some weapons because they're going to be going on a journey now. The promised land, and they would require some kind of protection. 
So they probably could have asked for weapons. Another source of weaponry would be when uh, after the incident in the Red Sea, where the you know the uh, the Egyptian soldiers were all uh, drowned. So even as their you know lifeless bodies would have washed up onto the shore, you know uh, the arms which are the weapons which are attached to their belt and all of that, they would have retrieved those weapons as well. So uh, so. Everything that is written in the scriptures can actually be, you know, logically, um, you know, backed up. So we must be willing to trust what the scriptures are teaching us. All right. Um, I think we can maybe close over here. So uh, if there are any more uh, doubts, you know, uh, those of you who are online could post your doubts in the stream page. Why did God choose Moses to leave the Israelites? Probably due to his parents, because they were a couple who did not go into idolatry like the others. And you know, just now we read in Joshua chapter 24, and we saw the way the most of the people went into idolatry. But there were some people, very few people, who held on to the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. They did not turn away. And uh, here was a couple who stayed faithful to the true God. And they also taught their children about him. And so Moses was aware of who this God is. So because of um, maybe it was because of um, his parents that Moses got children. You know, so I'm not sure to my explanation purely. All right. So uh, there may be other explanations as well. All right. So we will conclude now because we are out of time. And uh, yeah, any other questions that you would like to post uh, on the stream page, you're most welcome to. Thank you. Thank you so much.